Amen. My sins are gone. I want to thank the Lord for the forgiveness of sins. I want to thank Him that I confess my sins to Him and He accepted, you know, my sins. I cast my cares upon Him. I praise God that my sins is forgiven. Amen. Amen. We are living as sinners, your people whose sins are being forgiven. The Bible said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. The Word of God tells us that if we cover, anybody who cover their sins, if you sin and you cover it, cover it up your sin, the Word of God says you can't prosper. But he who confess and forsake will have mercy. So uh, the Lord, He promised us, He called us, He said, Come unto me all in that labor and a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for us. He is our burden bearer. He's our sin bearer. Amen. Yeshua, yes. the anointed one. Yes. He is the one that John the Baptist declared, behold the Lamb of God, God. that was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. He became flesh. Amen. The Bible tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, was God. The same was with God in the beginning. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. He was the Word that walked among men. The Word became flesh, and He tabernacled among us. Amen. It's a blessed privilege for us to be together again in the house of the Lord. We are continuing in the study of the book of Luke, and we are... Coming down to the end, we are down at the final chapter, chapter 24 of the book of Luke. This study took us a while, almost three years since we're going through the book of Luke. And it seems as though uh, in a couple of sessions, a few more studies, we will be able to bring uh, the book of Luke to an end. But today I want us to go back and start at uh, verse 50. In chapter 23 so we can put some context to what we are talking about we will uh, take it from uh, chapter 23 and verse 50 so we can understand what we are dealing with we bow heads in prayer gracious father we are grateful to you for the forgiveness of our sins we thank you for the hope and the confidence and the assurance that you have given unto us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And God, even as we are gathered at your table today, Father, we pray, most High God, that you'll feed us by the power of your words. We pray our hearts, Lord, will be prepared. We pray, Lord, for clean hands and pure hearts, even as we meditate upon the word of God. We ask that you heal our lands, heal our bodies, our soul, our mind, and our spirit. Manifest in our midst, even as we come before you today. We ask these favors in the precious, anointed name of your Son, Yeshua. Now we are at this point where um, Yeshua, he is crucified, he is placed on the cross, and we see all of the things that happened. He cried out to the Father. Forgive them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they have done. We saw where the thief on the cross, he cried out for repentance. Lord, remember me when you go into your kingdom. We saw the centurion, he acknowledged that Yeshua was a righteous man. We also saw that there were three hours of darkness that was over the whole earth. And all of these things we experienced, uh, or we dealt with last time. Also, we saw where Joseph of Arimathea, he was somewhere close by when he, he was looking on what was taking place. He, you know, looked at what was taking place where the crucifixion was concerned. And after the crucifixion came to an end, he stepped in. And this is where we... I think we are picking up here today, Joseph of Arimathea, he tells us in verse 50 and uh, chapter 23, and behold there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. So here we see that Joseph, he was a counselor, 
In other words, he was a member of the Sanhedrin Council, and this was the group of men, and I say men, didn't have no women involved, <laughs> a group of men who were leading uh, the nation of uh, Israel, spiritual, biblical Israel, was being led by a group of men that is called the Sanhedrin Council. And these men will control or supervise the spiritual affairs of the um, Hebrew uh, Israelite people because at that time they were under the control of the European Gentile Romans and they didn't have control over their, their country because they were invaded by the European Gentile Romans but they were allowed to control the spiritual affairs of their country. So this man, Joseph of Arimathea, he was on the council of the Sanhedrin and uh, himself and Nicodemus. Nicodemus also was on the Sanhedrin council. And uh, this man, Joseph of Arimathea, in other parts of the scripture, he said that he was a rich man. He was well to do. And not only that, he was a disciple, and he was a secret disciple of Yeshua, just like Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a disciple, but because he was on the Sanhedrin Council, he did not want to go to Jesus by day, so he went to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. We have the record of that. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were disciples of Yeshua, but they were undercover, they were in secret. And what the scripture is telling us here that this man, Joseph, he was a good man. In other words, he was just, and uh, he was declared to be somebody that was righteous or in good standing with the Most High God. Then uh, it said in, in verse 51, the same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them who uh, 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 he was of Armatea, a city of Judah, uh, of the Jews, sorry, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So what they're saying here, even though he was on the Sanhedrin Council, when the Sanhedrin Council meet and they make the decision to um, put Yeshua to death, Joseph did not give his consent. Apparently Nicodemus and Joseph did not give their consent for uh, Yeshua to be uh, put to death, to be crucified. And uh, it tells us where he was from. He was from Armatea, which I think was in the province of Judea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. He was looking for Yeshua. He was on the lookout for the Messiah. And it tells us the man went to Pilate, and beg for the body of Yeshua. So Pilate is the Roman governor. He is the European Gentile Roman governor who was in charge of the whole region. And he was, he had a jurisdiction over the crucifixion. He's the one that declared um, Yeshua to be innocent. Twice he declared Yeshua to be innocent. Took a bowl of water and washed his hands said he won't have nothing to do with this just man. And here we see um, uh, uh, Joseph of Armatea, he went to Pilate and he begged for the body of Yeshua. And it was getting close to the end of the day. It was Friday afternoon and it was getting close to when the Sabbath time or the Sabbath period is going to come in and everything was in a rush and they were in a hurry to get the bodies of these crucified men down from the cross but i want to let you know that back in that time the romans when somebody is crucified the romans said that they did not deserve to be buried they didn't deserve to get a proper burial so what the romans will do they will leave the body up on the tree or on the cross on the stake wherever the crucifixion take place they will leave the body up on that stake up on that cross and it will stay there for a long period of time and the vultures will come and they will devour that body because what they were doing they were sending a message because the um, Hebrew Israelite people 
They were under the control of the Romans, and the Romans were sending a message. And what they were saying is that we crucified this person, and we're going to leave him up there as, a, as evidence to let you know that you can't mess with us. And it was a form of intimidation. You know, because when, you know, these uh, Hebrew Israelite people see somebody crucified, hanging up there, and you passing day after day, and see a person up on that stake, up on that cross, crucified, and the vultures coming and devouring their body, man, that is going to send the fear of God into you. And as I said last week, that I am using uh, history to parallel, or parallel the Bible with history. And I said last time that crucifixion parallel lynching. And just like how these uh, European Gentile Romans will let the body of the crucified person stay up on the tree for a long period of time, it was the same thing that was taking place in our history back in the United States after slavery when the uh, European people will lynch black men and black women. They will let them stay up on the tree in the community so that people in the community can see that you can't mess with us. And that used to terrify. It will terrify members of the black community. And I was looking up where these people have to run. They have to run away from the south. They have to give up their whatever little possession they have, leave it behind. And they have to be on the run because when uh, somebody is lynched in the community, you can you imagine a person is lynched? And you pass in and you see somebody up on a tree there. Black man, black woman is lynched. And you know that you're a black person. And you have to look at that. It's going to drive fear into you. So what I'm saying is that the Romans or the Europeans have a history of using this kind of a tactics as a weapon of intimidation against people. And what they were doing back in the time of Yeshua they were leaving the bodies of these crucified people up on the cross, up on the tree, up on the stake, wherever they did, did the crucifixion. Leave it there so that the Hebrew Israelite people who they were controlling will be intimidated and they will know that you can't mess with us. And uh, we continue. It tells us, Joseph, in verse um, 50, the same had... Sorry, let me go to 52. Um, yes, 52. This man went to Pilate. So because Joseph, he knew that the Romans had the habit of leaving the body of crucified people up on the tree, up on the stake for a long period of time, and their bodies were being destroyed by these vultures, and he didn't want uh, that kind of uh, thing to happen to the body of Yeshua. Amen. He went to Pilate and he asked permission for the body to be taken down. And in, I think in, in, in the Gospel of John, it tells us that Pilate, he wanted very verification that Yeshua was already there. So he called in the European Gentile soldier and he asked him the question whether or not if this, these men were dead. And uh, the European Gentile soldier confirmed that they were already dead. So he wasn't satisfied. He gave commandment or he gave the orders to these soldiers to go out and break their legs. And these soldiers came back out and they went to the first male factor. And I guess he wasn't already there and they broke his leg because breaking the legs, it means that you can't stand up properly. So. Um, you will lose uh, consciousness easily, you will be in more pain, more blood, if you have a little bit of blood in your body, it will drain out and it will hasten death. And they broke the two legs of these male factors and when they come to Yeshua, um, he was already dead. So they didn't bother to break, 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 to break the leg because breaking the leg is to hasten death, but he was already dead. So what the soldier did, he pulled out his sword and he pushed his sword through the side of Yeshua and the word of God said, forthwith all came blood and water. So after they did all of this to verify that you know, Yeshua was dead, uh, permission was given 
to Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus team up. Nicodemus, who was in John chapter 3, he team up with um, Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus came in and he brought in 100 pounds of spice. And Nic uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they took the body of Yeshua down from the cross and they wrap it in a linen cloth and they put the spice with it. Amen. And, you know, so that they can preserve the body. And in verse uh, 53, and he took the body, he took it, and he took it down, meaning the body, and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulchre that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. So all this is in, in fulfillment of scripture that Yeshua was supposed to be buried in a borrowed tomb, a new tomb in which no man was laid. And here we see this is being fulfilled. And it tells us, and that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So you can see by reading here that these two men, they um, prepared the spices. And I guess, uh, you know, that was done in advance because they have some kind of indication. I was saying last week that Joseph of Arimathea, he probably knew somewhere along the line that something bad is going to happen to Yeshua. So he prepared a tomb and he prepared the spices and he was somewhere close by watching because I guess he didn't want the, the, the soldiers, the Gentile European soldiers to see him so he was in hiding. And when he knew that everything was over, he went and he gave the body, get permission to take the body down. He spiced up the body, wrapped it up in the linen cloth, and then he put it in the tomb. These two men, they think that they were doing a proper job. They believe that uh, we, we are doing a great job, just like us men. Eh? <laughs> My wife was away for a week, and I was home by myself. I was the boss. I was in charge. <laughs> and I, I, I thought I was doing a good job, but you know, uh, sooner or later, I'm going to find out that I didn't do a, a good job. I didn't do a good job enough. She's going to find some kind of fault. Amen. <laughs> so these men, they thought they were doing an excellent job, and I thought they did a good job. Wrap up the body in the linen, put a hundred pounds of spice, you know, on the body. <laughs> Amen. It tells us they laid him in a, in, a, in a sepulchre or in the side of the hill. I guess they hew out or cut out, uh, you know, a tomb in the side of the rock and they place Yeshua in the, 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 the sepulchre or in the, the, the tomb and they roll a great stone in front of it. And these men think that was it. We did a good job. And it tells us in verse 54, and that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. So this was the preparation. This was the time when the Hebrew Israelite people will prepare for Passover and also they will prepare for uh, the Sabbath. And uh, these uh, leaders of the people, these elders, this is the time that they are preparing for Passover and they are preparing for the Sabbath. And they just finished killing Yeshua. All of what is happening here, this is the time when they will kill all of the lambs because Passover time, you know, is when they kill the lamb. They will kill uh, thousands of lambs, you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of lambs they will kill to offer up for the sins of the people. And it was during this Passover time when all of the lambs were supposed to be killed that they were killing Yeshua. And uh, the Word of God tells us that he was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. So these men, they thought that they were doing, you know, God's service by killing Yeshua. But what they were doing, they were actually killing the Lamb of God. Amen. And the scripture is saying here that they were, it was the preparation. It was the time of Passover and it was the, the Sabbath was coming, you know, fast. And, you know, what I'm seeing here is that these men were the religious leaders of the people. Yes. And they were killing somebody. Yes. 
put somebody to death. They were there watching the execution. And then after the execution, they would go to the temple. Go to the temple and they will perform their duties. You know, and we're talking about religious people. We're talking about so-called God-fearing men who will just kill somebody or put somebody to death. And then they will go to the temple and perform their services. And you know, what I'm seeing here is that religion is closely knit with evil and wickedness. When you look at the history of religion, you will see the amount of wickedness, sinful acts that is associated with religion. Religion is not enough. Amen. Religion, we need, we need to have more than religion. We need to have relationship. And these men didn't have any relationship with the Most High God. They have religion. And they can kill somebody and they can go to the, 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 the temple and perform their services. And they were, they, they were considered to be good men, good righteous men. And, you know, it's the same reference we could make at the end, you know. In history, all of these Europeans who were doing all of the lynching that we talk about, you know all these men were good Christian men? Do you know that? All of these European men who were lynching, our forefathers, they were good Christian men. The next day, if it was a Saturday that they did their lynching, the Sunday they were going to church. You think one little lynching will stop them from going to church? They go to church because they, they thought they were doing a service to God and to their community. So even after they kill somebody, they hang somebody up and cut out you know, his tongue and cut his balls and you know, open him up and take out his heart and use all of these different things as a souvenir. They will still go to church because they were considered to be good Christian men. Amen. And that's what I'm saying is that religion is closely knit to evil and wickedness. Yes, Amen. And you, you, you can see the reference that is in the Bible here. These men are religious men. You couldn't be more religious than these men. There are some things that they will never do on the Sabbath day. But here, they were killing somebody, Amen. one of their own. And after they finished killing him, they were able to go and prepare for the Sabbath. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. It tells us, uh, and that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on, and in verse 55, and the women also. Amen. Here we are, on the women again. These women are giving up. These women, they keep on following Yeshua. They go into the end. They're not giving up. They're not quitting. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee. These women came with Yeshua from Galilee. The distance from Galilee is about three, five days walking distance. If you don't go through Samaria, because back in that time, the Hebrew Israelite people, they have no dealings with the Samaritans. So what they will do, instead of going through Samaria, that will take off two days traveling time off their trip. They will go around Samaria. So it will take them five days. So these women, it took them five days. Could you imagine that? This is great commitment. They commit themselves to Yeshua so much that they will travel a distance of five days so that they can see what was going to be the end, what was going to happen to him. They follow after, and they saw the sepulcher and how his body was laid. So what is happening here? These two uh, men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they prepared the spices, spice up the body, wrap the body up in a uh, linen, place it in a tomb, roll a stone over the mouth of the tomb, and they thought that everything was okay. But here we are seeing here that these women came, uh, which came with him from Galilee. They didn't think that the job that was done by Joseph and Nicodemus was good enough. They didn't believe that Yeshua was getting a proper burial. <laughs> They follow after and saw the sepulchre. They go and they take a look. They take a yes, thank you. They examine it. They took a look at the sepulchre. A 
and they saw how the body was laid. Amen. They look at the spice, a hundred pounds of spice. <laughs> they say, man, listen, man, he deserves something better than this. <laughs> we are not going to give him that kind of burial. We are talking about women. Same women who the silence in the Bible is doing all of this here for uh, Yeshua. And how his body was laid, and look at the body, and they say, well, this is not good enough. But they don't have enough time to uh, rectify the situation. So in verse 56, and they return and prepare spices. They already spice up the body. He already put a hundred pounds of spice on the body. How much more spice you need? These women are saying that you didn't put enough. Amen. It's not enough. They return and they prepare spices and ointment. Amen. And they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it was the Sabbath that was coming. And these women, they were obeying the Sabbath. They didn't break the Sabbath. They stayed home on the Sabbath. And I want us to understand that Saturday is the Sabbath according to the Bible. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, Sunday is the Sabbath. <laughs> Sunday is not the Sabbath. And I'm not a Sabbath person, but what I'm saying, according to the scripture, Sunday is, Saturday is the Sabbath. And uh, people in New Testament time, during the time of Yeshua, they kept the Sabbath. And Yeshua never stopped anybody from worshiping all the Most High God on the Sabbath. And the reason why we are worshiping on Sunday today is not because Sunday is the Sabbath. Uh, we are worshiping on Sunday because people back in that time, all the disciples or the, the, the people who came after Yeshua, what happened is that because Yeshua was risen on a Sunday, they decided they were going to start worshipping on a Sunday. And then the European Gentile Roman Constantine or Constantine, whichever way you want to uh, pronounce it, he decided he's going to make it legal. He made Sunday worship legal. You know, because the Christians, they were worshipping on a Sunday because uh, their Messiah was risen on a Sunday. But it doesn't mean that Sunday is the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath really is um, Saturday. So here we are seeing in New Testament time, people are still worshiping on the Sabbath. Amen. So it tells us in chapter 24, as we move into 24, it said, Now upon the first day of the week, so we just finished the Sabbath, which was Saturday. Now it's the first day of the week, which is Sunday. This is um, Sunday morning. And it said, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. So this is Sunday morning and it is very early, not just early, it is very early. So it could be maybe 3, 4 o'clock in the morning that we are talking about here, very early. Uh, they came, the day that the scripture is talking about here is these women who follow Yeshua all the way from Galilee, who was not satisfied with the way how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea spice the body of the Lord and wrap it up and put it in that sepulchre because they weren't satisfied and they went home and they prepared um, spices and ointment. They came back early the Sunday morning after the Sabbath. They came to the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and sorting others with them. So what is happening here is that these women, they were putting their life at stake. You know, they were putting their life on the line because it was illegal. What they were doing here, it was they were breaking the European rules because what happened, if you read other parts in, in the, the gospel, you will see where um, a seal was put on the tomb because the um, leaders of the temple went to Pilate and they gave him a story saying that there is a rumor that his disciples might steal the body. Yes. So what they did, they get a pilot to put a seal. His seal of approval, they seal the tomb that nobody can open it. That's right. Nobody can get into it. And what they did, not only sealing the tomb, but they placed our soldiers to watch the tomb. Yes. So what these women were doing here, it was a great step of faith. And they were putting their life on the line you know, to go and associate themselves with somebody who was just crucified. 
I tell you, uh, no man, none of his disciples is going to do that yet. The disciples already go and hide away themselves. <laughs> they are already chicken out. They are putting their lives at risk. <laughs> you know, these women, they love Yeshua so much that they don't care much about what a pilot and the Roman soldiers might do to them. They are coming early in the morning and they're coming with their spices and which uh, they, they, they have prepared and sorting others with them. So they went and they get reinforcement. They get more women. Yes, you know, the church grew a lot, you know, with, by women. And women, women, you know, when you have a church, a growing church is a church where you see a lot of women. One would start coming and then they invite another and they keep inviting each other because women have a genuine love for the Most High God. And they were able to gather more women together. And it tells us in verse 2. And they found the stone roll away from the sepulchre. Now, when you read other parts of uh, the gospel, you will see that it tells you that early Sunday morning, sometime during the Sunday morning early, there was a great earthquake. And uh, it tells us the tomb was ripped apart and an angel descended after this earthquake came and rolled away the stone. And these European soldiers who were guarding the, the tomb they were shaking in their boots. And what they did, they run into the city. And you can read and find that in the other parts of the gospel. They run into the city and they go to the leaders of the temple and they told them what was going on, that the, the, the tomb was ripped apart. Remember that I said before that there was a sealed place on the tomb. Everything was ripped apart by this old prank and this angel came down and rolled away the stone, not to let Yeshua out. Yeshua didn't need anybody to roll the stone away, you know, because he was able to walk through walls, but the stone was rolled away so that when these women uh, come to visit the tomb, and when the disciples, you know, arrive to visit the tomb, they will have access to the tomb. So what I'm saying is that these soldiers go into town and complain to um, the elders of the temple what uh, the situation was with the tomb, that the tomb was ripped apart. I know what they did. They said to them, be quiet, be silent. Don't, don't, don't say it to anybody. You know, we are going to give you money. Just keep it as, as a secret. And we will make it known that his disciples, they came by night and they stole the body. But you don't say nothing and we're going to pay you off. And what they did, they pay these men, they bribe these soldiers. To keep quiet, not to give out the word about the outbreak and about the angel that descended and rolled away the stone, but publicizing that uh, his disciples came and they stole the body. And even now we have this, um, you know, scandal that people will use from time to time. They will say that the body of Yeshua was stolen; he wasn't resurrected. And some people will say, "Well, you know, um, he wasn't really dead." Uh, he was still alive when he was taken up from the tomb, from the cross, sorry. And uh, what happened is that because inside the tomb, they said inside the tomb was cool, so because it was cool and he wasn't completely uh, dead, he revived himself and he was able to free himself and get out from the tomb. So all these kind of a, a scandalous story is out there. Amen. About the resurrection, because we have to understand that the resurrection of Yeshua it is the foundation of our faith. Amen. It is the foundation, the foundation of our faith, or if you want to say Christianity, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of Christianity is built on the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. And if there is no resurrection, it means we got no foundation. What the Bible said, if the foundation is destroyed, what will the righteous do? That is the question. If the foundation is destroyed, what will the righteous do? So that is the reason why that the enemy is trying to attack the resurrection. Amen. Because if the resurrection is attacked, if the enemy is successful in destroying the doctrine of or the teaching of the resurrection, it means that we have no hope. It means that we don't have any hope of getting resurrected either. Amen. When the Bible talks about being absent,
absent from the body and present with the Lord. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of his archangel and the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain unto the end, we shall be caught up to meet him. If the resurrection, if Yeshua is not resurrected, it means that none of that is going to take place for you and I. No Glory to God. We have no hope. As the Bible said, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are like all men most miserable. So that is the reason why the resurrection of Yeshua is constantly under attack. Amen. Praise the Lord. It tells us that these women came back with the spices and they found the stone roll away. You know, that's the reason why uh, you got to read uh, other parts of the gospel to find out some of these things. And you know, it, it might have, have solved us better if instead of we having four gospels, if we only have one. You know, if everything was just rolled into one and you get all the information in one, it might have benefited us better. But you got to go from one book to the next to find out some of these things that I'm talking about here. So there was an earthquake. Here it, it doesn't record that there was, there was an earthquake, but an earthquake did take place. And an angel or two angels came down and they rolled away this huge stone that was on the mouth of the tomb. And it tells us in verse 3, and they enter in. My dear, these women are brave. You know? <laughs> these women are brave. They are enter, they enter into a tomb. Amen. They didn't stay outside. They go. They, they went and they saw that this uh, stone that was on the mouth of the tomb was rolled away. And they didn't just stay outside like some of the disciples and look in. But they went inside the tomb because they went there with one purpose and one purpose alone. It was to anoint the body of Yeshua, make sure that he's properly looked after. Amen. So they went in and they found not the body of the Lord Yeshua. The body was not there. The body was gone. Amen. Yeshua already gone. Amen. He's already resurrected. And it, the scripture tells us in verse 4, and it came to pass as they were much perplexed. In other words, they were confused. Amen. They were puzzled. Confused and puzzled because they don't understand what happened to the body. The night before, you know, Friday, late Friday afternoon, they saw um, Nic uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea place the body in the tomb. And now they go back there and the body is not here. They were perplexed, they were puzzled, confused. They are out. Behold, two men stood behind them in shining garment. So I'm picturing this. This is, in, this is happening in the tomb itself. It must have been a big tomb. <laughs> because inside the tomb, these, some of these women in the tomb, and the Yeshua body is not there. And behind them, there is um, this uh, person who appeared in two men. He said two men stood behind them in shining garment. And apparently these are two angels who came in the tomb while these women were there. And it tells us in verse 5, and as they were afraid, they're not afraid of the dead, <laughs> but they're afraid of somebody that looked like he's alive. When they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they, uh, they, said, uh, they said to them, Amen, why seek ye the living among the dead? So these are the two angels speaking to the women and asking them the question, I guess this is a kind of sarcastic kind of question. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? In other words, if you're looking for somebody that's alive, the graveyard is not the place to start. You know, people don't want, you know, hide out in the graveyard. <laughs> you know, living people don't go and hide in the graveyard. If you're looking for a living person, the graveyard is not the place for you to look. To, to, to look. If you're looking for somebody that is dead, no, then you have to go to the graveyard. So why seek ye? The living among the dead. He is not here. Amen. He is not in the tomb. Amen. Yeshua is not in the tomb. Amen. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. Amen. 
Glory be to God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If you go not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you on myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So where Yeshua is right now, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. He is not dead. He is not in the grave. Glory be to God. Death couldn't hold him down. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who have given us the victory. True Lord, Yeshua, glory to God. The angel proclaimed, amen, to these women. He is not here in verse 6, but he's risen. He is risen. You're supposed to say he's risen indeed. You're not following? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Glory to God. It's not a Catholic thing. <laughs> he is risen. <laughs> he is risen indeed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Remember how he spoke to you when he was yet in Galilee. So the angel, the angel here is, rem is reminding these women about two, year, two weeks before when Yeshua was in Galilee, he spoke to them concerning his suffering, spoke to them concerning his crucifixion, spoke to them concerning the way how the Gentiles is going to abuse him. He is going to be torn over into the hands of sinners, as he said, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And what he talks, when he talks here about deliver, he is talking about, he's making reference here uh, in regards to what was done by um, you know, the guy that betrayed him, uh, Judas. Judas betrayed Yeshua. And uh, when, he, when he said here, he will be delivered into the hand of sinful men, he's talking about what was done by Judas betraying him. And all of that was fulfilled. He was betrayed. But he didn't stop there. He said, and, and we crucified. And the crucifixion did happen. It was fulfilled. But that wasn't the end. And the third day, rise again. So on the third day, the third day, Yeshua was risen. He came out from the grave. Out from the grave, he arose. Hallelujah. He was delivered from death. Death couldn't hold him. Death had no power over him. And in verse 8, and they remember his words. They remember his words. And we today, we need to, this is our biggest problem today, especially in this time, is remembering the word of God. You can't remember something that you don't study. Something that you never read, something that you never learn, you never meditate on. You can't remember it. I know all of us, you know, say, well, the Holy Ghost is going to bring it back to me. Holy Ghost can't bring back to you what you never study, you never read, you never um, meditate on. I think the Holy Ghost is going to bring it back to you. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Amen. So shall my words be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the things that I please. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Amen. Job said he has seen the word of God more than is necessary food. Amen. Brethren, we need to meditate on the word. The word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Brother, we need to grab a hold of the word of God. God. Hallelujah. Meditate on the word. You know, back in my time when I got saved, back in 1974, when I got saved, we used to have in church uh, Bible boxing. Back in that time, church used to be nice. <laughs> church not nice now. People don't like to go to church now. But back in the day, church used to be nice. And we used to have Bible boxing. And you will, you know, study and meditate on scriptures. And you will memorize scriptures. And then you will challenge somebody uh, to buy the box. You know, back in, the, in those days, we don't have time to go and get guns and get knives and fight and kill each other. We get the Bible and we study the Bible and we meditate on the Bible and we start Bible boxing. Amen. And I used to be a champion with Bible boxing is concerned, meditating on the Word of God, studying the Word of God. 
You know, back in, in, the, in, in the day, people, uh, they love the scripture, they fall in love with the scripture, it's not like now. And we need to return back to these things, uh, memorizing the scripture. I remember one time, and I used to memorize chapters. I don't even think he probably could do that anymore. <laughs> Maybe that uh, iPhone that he had, they probably just take that right away. No, I think I still have all right, sorry. <laughs> Amen. I remember you used to recite a lot of, you know, a whole chapter. You know, that is good. We need to start memorizing and meditating on the Word of God. Glory be to God. We know so much of what is going on on, you know, Facebook and, and all of these different things that are happening out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the most important thing that we need to know is the Word of God. When you know the Word of God, the Word of God helps you to identify other things. You know, there are things that I face in my life and I never see them before, never hear them before. And as soon as I, these things come into my life, because of the fact that I know the Word of God, I can just write out the back say, this is not something good. Why? Because I know the Word of God. I have the Word of God in me. The Word of God is used to identify things and make things clear. Amen. So we need to get back to the place where we will meditate on the Word of God. Don't let one day pass without you taking a scripture and meditating on the Word of God. You don't have to take a whole chapter. It could be just a few verses. In verse 9, we're coming out to the end. And return from the sepulchre. So these women, they are not named yet. They return from the, from the gravesite. The body was not there. They were told by the two angels, he's not here. Why seek he the living among the dead? And they leave the gravesite, and they told all uh, these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So all of the big boys, the big guns, they wasn't there. <laughs> the apostles wasn't there. And these women, because they wouldn't give up on Yeshua, Yeshua, um, he appeared to them when they got the message first from the angel and they will meet also with Yeshua. And they carry the message to uh, the apostles, to the eleven, and to all the rest. And here we see in verse 10, they are identified. He said it was Mary Magdalene. So the, 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 one of the women, one of the women that was there with uh, you know, uh, the group, it was Mary Magdalene. And when you read the, uh, the, the, the gospel, you will see that Mary Magdalene, she was the woman that Yeshua deliver her from seven devils. She was possessed by seven devils and Yeshua cast out seven devils from Mary Magdalene. And that is the reason why Mary Magdalene will not give up on Yeshua. And when, when God, you know, does something in your life, you don't give up on Him. When God performs a miracle, and you don't have to be a healing, you know, when God performs the miracle of salvation in your life, you don't give up. There is no distance that is too far, you know, for you to go with him. These women came all the way from Galilee, five days journey. And here we see that Mary Magdalene, amen, in spite of the fact that she was demon possessed, she was delivered. And because she was grateful to Yeshua, she continued to follow him, even to the cross. She was following him. And he said, I'm Joanna, Joanna here, she is the wife of Susa, and Susa, he was the steward of um, Herod, King Herod. So her husband had a high position with uh, King Herod. And I don't know if her husband uh, gave her permission to be out there with Yeshua, but this woman was an influential woman. Mary Magdalene, she was somebody that was well known because she was always, all, always with Yeshua. And this woman here, Joanna, she's a high profile woman. She, these women are recognized. And Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, you know, which told these things to the apostles. So these two high profile women got the news about the resurrection of Yeshua. The apostles wasn't there. They came to give the news to the apostles. And here the scripture tells us in verse 11, and their word seems to them as idle tales, and they believe them not. 
So what they said is that, girls, you're speaking nonsense. Mary Magdalene, I know you was demon possessed, you know, and you say you get over it. But you better check yourself and see if one of those demons didn't creep back in. Amen. They are saying that, you know, you're speaking nonsense. And they did not believe them. And as I said before, these are two high profile women. Mary Magdalene was always with Yeshua. We have here uh, Joanna also. She's a high profile woman. And here we see that these two women especially is giving the apostles the news in regards to the resurrection. And they have seen it. It, it appeared to them as idle tales. And idle tales is talking about nonsense. You're speaking nonsense. What you're saying doesn't make sense. And not only that, they did not believe. Amen. They did not believe them. And as I said before, back in that time, the words of women didn't have a lot of weight. And, you know, when a woman, for a woman to, you know, have some weight in testifying against a man, she had to have three women. It needs three women to stand up to give testimony against one man. So back in that time, that was how the culture operated. They didn't really believe the words of women. And we have seen evidence of this year. They did not believe. And as we bring down to an end, then arose Peter and ran to the sepulchre. And stopped at stooping down, he beheld the linen cloth laid by himself and departed, departed, wondering in himself at that which had come to pass. So here we see, again, it's important to really go back and read uh, other parts of the gospel to get uh, more information. And as I said before, it might have so us better if we only have one gospel, if everything was together and we can just, you know, read and get all the information, but they don't have it like that. And uh, when you go to other parts of the gospel, you will see where he tells you that Peter, Peter and another disciple were running together to go to the tomb. And the other disciple outrun Peter. Anybody read that? Yes. Other disciple outrun Peter. Because yes. Peter, he probably was a heavy guy like me. <laughs> so the other disciple, he sprinted ahead of Peter and he was able to outrun Peter going towards the grave. But when they reached the grave, this disciple, even though he was fast, he wasn't brave enough. So what he did, he go and he just looked into the grave. Amen. But Peter, he was gutsy. And when Peter reached at the gravesite, although in this text here, he doesn't tell us that, in other parts of the gospel, when Peter get to the gravesite, he didn't hesitate and he just rushed right into um, the sepulchre, into the grave. And as we close it up, it tells us, um, then arose Peter and ran to the sepulchre and stooping down, he beheld the linen cloth laid by himself and departed, wandering himself at that which had come to pass. So it seems as though Yeshua get up from bed and he just make the bed up, he make up the thing, he fold up everything, he clean up, you know, everything, fold up the, 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 the thing. And I guess this is a message to some people who keep a, a dirty, you know, room. Yeshua put things together, tidy things up. Didn't leave things messy, put it away and then he, he go, man, amen. He took off, amen, <laughs> glory to God. May the Lord bless us. I will ask the musicians to come back. We will sing a song. Glory to God. Hallelujah, bless the Lord.